in this session today so that we can put it on the MFA um, YouTube page for future reference for students and, and others who might be interested in the topic. Um, so with that said, if you'd like to turn off your mic, just so we don't get any weird feedback if stuff is happening in your background, that would be super helpful. Um, and to give an overview of what we're going to encounter today, I've got a brief presentation, maybe 10-15 minutes. Um, then we're going to hand it over to Dr. Dandona, who will speak about um, her experience as a Fulbright Scholar in Scotland, as well as the process. And also after that, we'll hand it over to Robert Nagelis, who will speak to his experience in China, or well, not in China, but applying to China, and then having the COVID experience. Um, and, and luckily, just to, uh, if anybody's recently joined us, he's, he mentioned he will be able to do it next year. So <laughs> don't worry, it hasn't been canceled. Um, so let's jump right in. Um, oh, and one more reminder, if you have just joined us, um, feel free to put your email in the chat and I will follow up with all of those email addresses to uh, make sure that folks get a link to this presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. A little bit of history. The Fulbright program was established in 1946 to expand and strengthen relationships um, between the people of the world and the United States. Um, and just recently, they've put out an update that they'll be delaying the start of the 2020-2021 Fulbright programs um, until after January 1st. And that's an evolving situation. So all those folks who are in the pipeline, and we're lucky to have one with us today with Robert, um, will be able to continue their, their process as Fulbright scholars. Um, so there are three types of Fulbright grants that you might be interested in. Um, there's the Open Study and Research, which is sort of the traditional award opportunity. Um, this would be for uh, designing a proposal for a specific country. It's assumed that you probably have about five plus years of experience as an artist or designer um, or a scholar. Uh, and in contrast to that is the student program. Those would be people currently in school or up to five years out of school. So a lot of the folks who are currently in the graduate program or a academic program, that might be of more interest to you. And then the other option is the English teaching assistant, um, where you're placed in a classroom abroad to provide assistance to the local English teachers. Um, and that is not art art or design specific. So just so you have a sense of those grants. Um, more info on the Open Study and Research Scholar Award. Um, this is the one that we've heard the most interest in, so that's why we've got a little bit more uh, information here. Uh, this would be the classic like six to 12 month option, um, but that's not to say there aren't flex awards, and there's also postdoctoral and early career awards that are available. These are links in the presentation. So once you get this presentation, feel free to click those and do a bit more exploration on your own. You'll probably know what's best suited to your uh, particular individual situation. Um, and then just to follow up with some resources from our past two webinars, um, if you need help coming up with a project idea, we did an entire session on brainstorming, and this link will take you to our brainstorming checklist, um, which is just a tool to help you get a whole lot of ideas down fast. Um, and then to follow that up, if you are um, needing help with locating a partner, we similarly have a worksheet um, from our second webinar that you can click on and check out, and that can help you brainstorm how to find partners if you need an affiliate um, over in the country that you're applying to. Um, just to echo what you'll probably hear many, many, many times today is that every country is different. Um, and each country will have different uh, guidelines on how to find a partner or affiliate. If you need one, some countries do, some countries provide them for you. So just to be mindful of that. All right. So today uh, we're checking in on folks' progress. If you came to all three, this would be a time when we can take general Q&A and specifically talk about the project statement. Um, an easy way to start outlining is to answer who, what, where, why, when, and how about your project. Um, and similar to our other two, um, don't worry about writing a perfect statement at this point. You will be thinking about um, just getting the words out. You can edit and you will edit 
a lot. Um, but for now, just think about um, getting all your ideas out on paper or typed out. So that who idea, you'll want to be able to address who's involved in the project besides yourself. You'll want to talk about um, with whom will you be affiliated or would you like to be affiliated? Um, with whom will you be studying or working? Um, you'll want to be able to address what. What do you propose to do? What is exciting about it? What is new? What is innovative or unique? Um, what contribution will the project make to Fulbright's objectives, um, which are that we mentioned at the start of the presentation, cross-cultural interaction, mutual understanding. Um, you'll want to make sure you touch on that. And what is the background of the question you'll be asking or the topic you'll be investigating? Um, we're going to also share a folder of sample proposals. And you'll notice that everybody addresses this in a little bit different way, but this question does get answered. Um, what are your goals and what are your qualifications? You'll need to justify why you are the right person for this. When? Um, when will you carry out your study or your research? Um, you'll want to have some sort of timeline. You do want to, again, and I know, I'll be a broken record here, check the individual award. Each award has different guidelines, and you want to make sure you're tailoring the application um, to that specific set of guidelines. And when will you move through different stages of the process that you're proposing? Um, where? Where do you propose to conduct your study or research? Why is it important to even go abroad to carry out this project? Why in this particular country? Um, what sort of place is it? What are the conditions there? Um, you should have a clear commitment to and description of how you will engage with this host country community. And then why? Um, explain. Why do you want to do it? Why does it need to be conducted in that country? What is the significance of the project? Why are you motivated? What are the consequences? Um, you want to discuss the contribution to the field um, or to people's lives. And you'll want to give specific ideas for civic engagement. So the how, this would be like your methodology and your goals. How will you carry out this work? Um, what results do you hope to obtain? Do you have adequate formal training or skills or experience to do this? That speaks to um, the feasibility of the project. You want to make sure that you justify that you are properly trained to execute this idea. Are your language skills commensurate with the requirements of the project? And how will this help further your career, um, your academic and professional development? Are there challenges that you anticipate and how do you address them? If you're going to identify challenges, you want to be ready with a plan of action. And how will you engage the host country in, addi in addition to the project itself? So if you find yourself having difficulty answering any of those questions, um, a common tip that uh, came up in a lot of my research was trying to read three types of books, um, a history book about the country, a fiction book by a native writer, and a tourist guide or two. And that simple initial research will help make your uh, application look more specific, impressive, and focused. Um, so feel free to start investigating those basic texts for the country that you're interested in. And now when we get to crafting your proposal, um, the wonderful part about the Fulbright proposal is the freedom um, and the flexibility. That can also be difficult and um, challenging, so try to use it to your advantage. Um, as we mentioned earlier, fit and feasibility are a thing. This is where, um, I think in one of our past webinars we mentioned, this can be a point where you get tripped up. Um, so be able to answer how the culture and politics of the host country will impact your work, um, how the resources of the host country uh, will support the work, and address your language abilities. Um, and also be very clear and specific about your research me methodology. Um, ex explain your plan and explain how you will be accountable. Um, so if you're going to, the example we have here is if you're going to be interviewing people, perhaps an expert in your particular um, craft or skill, how will you locate that person? How will you contact them? Um, make sure that you're very clear about those types of things. Um, further information on fit and feasibility, if there could be any question, address it head on. 
make sure that you are direct um, so that any doubts are dispelled. Uh, be sure to use your personal history, things like your education, your personal experiences, your interests to explain how only you can do it. Um, that, that you are the most qualified person to execute this particular project. Um, an example, uh, someone studying comedy in China with a practitioner, they had eight years of comedy acting experience and had previous experience studying abroad in China. That personal history uh, supported the project really well. So this is a Venn diagram that, and variations of this pop up when you're, you're looking at best practices for these um, grant applications, but making sure to address the country, um, the award itself, and why you, and how those things overlap. So uh, take that into consideration. All of these different points you wanna make sure you're addressing. So is it a compelling idea? Um, prove that it's interesting, prove that it's impactful. Uh, the hero narrative is super useful. And if you're not familiar with that general grant writing principle, I have a link there to um, Dr. Kelsky's foolproof grant template. And um, that walks you through what is the hero narrative? How do you set it up? How do you place yourself as the hero in this narrative? Um, and that is a really useful tool. Um, how does it touch on a big picture topic? And how does your project fill a gap in that discourse? Don't be afraid to be bold. Uh, and then personalize it. Help the reader see the project through your eyes. Uh, what drew you to the topic? Why should you do this research rather than somebody else? Um, so that will help them understand why it's compelling. You also obviously want to use all your best writing skills. Action verbs, vibrant descriptions, energetic, heartfelt appeals. Um, try to avoid surface culture, things like the food is great. I like this one holiday, um, but instead talk more deeply about culture, things like social norms, concepts of the self versus groups, familial structures, etc. cetera. Um, the more nuanced you can be, the better. Um, and if you want to read more about that nuance um, idea, Paul's cultural iceberg theory is briefly and succinctly illustrated via that link. So I'll leave that for others to click on. Um, this is a great uh, diagram from Catherine Tertian, who was our visitor in the first webinar. Uh, she gave us this Fulbright project, and then your practice as an artist, um, your future progress, and then also the country. And as you can see, this is very similar to that other Venn diagram, but it's, it's good to see that you can arrange it in any way you want. Um, again, that's that flexibility of the Fulbright application. Uh, you want to consider your audience. So you're emphasizing cultural and educational exchange. I think Robert will be speaking to this a little bit. They care about your project, but also they don't care about your project in some ways. Like there's that you need to address your audience, which in this case is um, the country and the Fulbright committee. Um, clearly explain the worth for both parties involved. Uh, use layman's terms, be clear and concise, assume that the reader knows very little about your discipline, um, and study the organization that you hope to affiliate with. Um, embody their spirit, their mission, the purpose in your, in your project proposal. Um, so uh, there's one other caveat here. Some Fulbrights allow you to enroll in a graduate program, and there, I have received feedback that some of the folks attending these webinars are interested in this option. So I put a little bit of information here from the research as well. If that's your goal, you need to address why. Why do you wanna pursue this program in this country? What are your reasons for selecting this institution? Um, and do you have the requisite background to undertake that program? Um, also for those grad program interested folks, um, why? Do you want to gain a better understanding of the peoples and cultures of this country? Um, do you have sufficient language skills? And do you have the flexibility and dynamism necessary to achieve involvement in this host country? So if you're going that route, those are some of the points you want to consider including in your proposal. So as I mentioned, um, samples. This is a frequent request from folks at these webinars. Um, this first link is a template that you can try. You just scroll to the bottom and it gives you some structure to follow because that's what I'm hearing a lot of is that people struggle without structure. And this lays out one option of many. 
that you could try. Um, the folder of examples in bold, that is um, something that you can access a whole bunch of PDFs and documents of past proposals. And then a proposal checklist, which is essentially a one sheet summary of this presentation, similar to the other two that we're, we um, distributed. So um, we've got those familiar resource page links here, and then also works cited for this presentation. So if you want to go on a deep dive, you certainly can. There's lots of resources out there. Um, and I, again, will send out this link uh, shortly after our presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen now. And now everybody can see sort of a grid of each other and hand this over to Dr. Dandona. Thank you so much, Alan. That was just absolutely fantastic and so helpful. And I really wish that I'd had it when I was doing my application. It would have been great. Um, so I, I'm afraid that I don't have formal remarks prepared necessarily, but um, I'll speak a little bit about my experience and then I'm more than happy to answer any questions. And um, let me just start by explaining a little bit my own association with Fulbright. So um, I did my first Fulbright in 1998 and don't laugh, um, I did a Fulbright in Canada. Um, that sounds very strange, but I was actually in Quebec City, which is predominantly Francophone, um, and I was studying mid-18th century uh, Quebecois architecture right around the time of the Seven Years' War, which is when Britain um, conquered New France and, and colonized um, Canada. So um, that was my first experience, and I did that um, as one of those students who was less than five years out of school. So I, um, it was before I went to graduate school, and it was about I think one or two years after I had graduated with my bachelor's. So um, I found a sponsor who was interested in my research and applied as a kind of open research um, um, category so that I, I wasn't um, officially enrolled, but I did a kind of master's level um, project while I was there. So that was the first time that I was associated with Fulbright. And then um, about six years ago, I joined the local chapter of the Fulbright Association, uh, which is not the same as the folks who select grantees. Rather, um, it's the kind of service arm of Fulbright. And so if you are an alumni, uh, an alumnus of the program, um, or if you are a current grantee, either coming here uh, or, well, not going there because we're talking about here, but if, if someone is coming here as a Fulbright grantee or if they are a, a US-based alum, we provide um, kind of networking and, and different um, services and events to bring people together. So I have served on the board of the Minnesota chapter of the Fulbright Association for I think six years now. Um, and then as Ellen said, um, a couple of years ago, I applied for a Fulbright Scholar grant, which is the professional level of grant. Um, there's a misperception often that it's only limited to college professors, and that's absolutely not true. Um, I met tons of nurses, um, dancers, you know, artists, et cetera, while I was there. Um, and I was based specifically in the UK, um, but based up north in Scotland. So I, uh, let's see, anything else I want to say about that? Uh, one quick thing that I noticed in the presentation, Ellen, you kind of touched on the idea of familiarity with the country. And I will say that that's very important. Um, however, just uh, be careful, keep your eyes open, because for some of these grants, they actually want you to have had rather limited contact with that country previously, because the idea is that they're facilitating an exchange that has not previously happened. Um, and so in some cases, you're gonna wanna choose countries that are actually not as familiar to you. So um, just keep that in mind. But um, I was headed on sabbatical when I did this project and I knew that I um, wanted to research um, Kind of visuality and modes of picturing in the history of medicine specifically and i was interested in scotland because in the 18th century 19th century it was one of the most um kind of um 
prestigious places to study medicine, but also a place where there was a lot of groundbreaking innovation. Everything from um, asepsis and surgery, which made it possible to have surgery without almost automatically dying, um, to the use of chloroform, i.e. anesthesia in labor. Many of the things that we take for granted were actually pioneered in Scotland in this period. So I started off already with the understanding that I wanted to be in Scotland. And then the next step that I did was to look at the different um, grants and host institutions. And so in a lot of countries, you have kind of two different categories of grant. There is a general country grant, um, and then there are institution-specific grants. And the institution-specific grants are often going to say much more directly what it is they're looking for. Like, we want a geologist, you know, we want somebody who's interested in community art practice. And so um, sometimes I think it's really helpful uh, if you can find one of those specific institutions that's a really good fit for you, that can be a good way in because I think people tend more often to apply for the general country grants and then those become more competitive even than they should be. Um, in my particular case, I found an art school, um, Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design, which has a lovely florid name. Um, and it's named after an, an early donor. Duncan of Jordanston, and it's part of the University of Dundee. And so I started with the idea that, you know, by coming from an art school and going to an art school, I already had something in common um, with people there, and I would be able to not only bring something to the institution in terms of my background at MCAD, but then also see how things were done differently at an art and design school outside my own country and bring that back with me. So it seems like it was operating as a good exchange, not only on a personal level, but on an institutional level. And I think Ellen touched on this, um, but uh, maybe to just emphasize that you really do have to think about kind of three different um, issues when you're doing your application, the benefit to you professionally, the larger benefit to the field, the contribution that you're making, but you also need to think very carefully about what this exchange will do for the institution that you want to be a part of, but also for the country that you want to be a part of. And so, oh, I should add that I also served this past year as a reviewer um, for Fulbright applications in art history, people coming to the US. Um, and so based on that and based on my own experience, I can say, and the people that I met um, when I was doing my Fulbright, the, the issue not only of cross-cultural exchange, but also within that of kind of broader service to the community um, that you're a part of is really important. And so um, in many respects, I had a very research-oriented project um, which was a little different than most of the other people I met. There were a lot of projects that were very much um, kind of more community-based. For example, one of the studio art uh, grantees who was in Edinburgh was going out into local communities. She was um, working with kind of disadvantaged youth to um, create these handmade books and they were taking historical volumes of Shakespeare and other luminaries and kind of recreating them, making them their own. But the part that I think was compelling about her project was specifically that she identified in advance, you know, which communities would benefit from her practice. Um, and she made that such an important part of her project. Um, another um, grantee that I met was a journalist who ended up in Manchester. And she specifically um, spent six months interviewing um, refugees and writing about their stories. Um, it was published eventually in Al Jazeera. Um, and she did you know, what was really, really hard work because in the political atmosphere um, in the UK right now, people were very uh, at first unwilling to talk to her and she had to kind of go deep, if, if you know what I mean, to, to really um, be there long enough um, that people trusted her. So not every project has to have that intense social component, but um, most of the projects that I heard about um, that I've seen be successful were ones that did consider kind of the larger community, some kind of engagement. Um, what doesn't um, really work in many cases is a project that's really about your, just your own professional um, uh, development. That has to be part of it, um, but it really has to be bigger than that. And it has to really be about your country and the country that you're going to and thinking about 
how you're going to facilitate greater understanding, right? So in my case, even though I was working on this, you know, really geeky, super historical project, um, both of our countries right now are at a crisis point in terms of how we understand access to healthcare. And it's something that we all immediately have opinions about and um, can talk about together. Um, and, and so even though it was a historical project, it had this really intense contemporary relevance. And this came up um, during my interview. Um, so I know that it was an important part of how I was uh, evaluated as an applicant. Um, let's see, what other great insights do I want to share with you? I, well, maybe I will just share with you that this may be at this point sounding like a, an overwhelming amount um, of, of advice and things to think about. But I want to also say this, both of my Fulbright experiences, but definitely the last one, were easily among the best experiences of my entire life. I cannot tell you how incredibly privileged I felt to be able to have the space, the support, the time um, to, to really do what I love. And when you have a Fulbright in almost all circumstances, it opens doors for you that are not open otherwise. Um, so I was able to, you know, walk into anatomical museums that normally, and I don't know how compelling this will be for the rest of you, but normally are only open to medical students and say, you know what, I'm writing this book on the history of, of anatomical training, and I'd really like to see your 19th century uh, records and look at some of your specimens. And these are actually things that are quite tightly locked down in the UK. They have a lot of laws about human remains, et cetera. Um, but because I had a Fulbright and I had this kind of status, I was able to accomplish things that otherwise would have been very difficult to do. And so obviously that's not what you're going to want to do, but in terms of giving you kind of a um, an entry into maybe art spaces or professional circumstances, it's really invaluable, but it's also an amazing community. And so for my cohort, as, as it's called, there were three big events, kind of an orientation in London that was three or four days long. There was a mid-program forum. Um, I can't remember the city right now, but it's down south. It's one of the big port cities. Um, we all came together and presented our research in progress and then also um, had amazing opportunities to um, talk to curators and researchers. Um, I think it's Southampton, University of Southampton. Um, and because that's a big naval center for the UK, we got to talk to you know, the archeologist who dug up the Mary Rose, which is a, a 16th century ship that Henry VIII built that sank immediately and is the best preserved example of 16th century you know, um, boat, military boats. And, and then we also got to talk to um, I don't know. Anyway, we got to tour a million museums. We got to hear from um, environmental scientists and people who work on underwater preservation. We got to um, see Bodie McBoatface. I don't know if you know about this. This is one of the most famous underwater exploration vessels in the world. It can go kind of deeper than anything else. We got to go and, and look at it. We didn't get to ride in it, though. So I'm still sad about that. But um, And then the, the final one of these was in Glasgow. And so you're not only in a cohort with people from all different backgrounds, all different fields. And we were together, students and scholar level, which was also really nice. Um, so you're meeting these people with just amazing, inspiring projects. Um, but you're also being kind of introduced to um, other people in, in all different areas that are just kind of the great thinkers and makers and, and creators out there. So it was absolutely exhilarating. Um, I spent a, a week straight on my application, um, and it was 100% worth it and I would do it again. So I, I encourage all of you, I, I really think there's a lot more opportunities for studio arts than people would assume. Um, I encourage all of you to do it and don't be intimidated by things like language requirements. Fulbright has gradually been kind of loosening this um, and it varies very much by country. Um, and there's plenty of countries out there where you don't need a foreign language, for example. Um, check it out. It's, it's definitely worth it, and it will change your life for the better. And Ellen, I, I think that's all I've got, but Sounds when good. the time is right, I'm ready to answer questions. Um, that's excellent. Let, let's hold questions, and Robert, let's toss it over to you for maybe 10 minutes, and then we'll open up for a, a good solid 15 Q&A. Sure. Okay. I don't know if I'll... Yeah. If, and if you um, don't go 10 minutes, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. 
Um, uh, first of all, I think uh, there's been a lot of really great information already. And Dr. Dandona, that's, I mean, give a lot of really great insight and, um, and the presentation that Ellen pre prepared, I think it's really useful. And again, I echo the sentiment. I wish I'd had that uh, when, I, when I applied. Uh, I, you know, I found it very hard to get information uh, really and to figure out how to, how to apply. Um, I, I am an artist, I'm, I'm a painter. Um, I, you know, I've also branched out into sound art and, you know, things that are a little more, um, you know, inclusive or, or, you know, um, as a, you know, interactive, that's the word I'm looking for, but at my heart, I'm a painter, you know, and, and how, and, and at the same time, it's very clear the the fundamentally most important thing for the Fulbright is that your is the uh, cultural connection, right? Um, at heart, to, to be a Fulbrighter, you are a cultural ambassador, and they care about that. I think above the project. The project has to be good. It has to be professional. It has to be, you know, respectable. It has to be real. You have to be able to, you know, to carry it out. But you are a cultural ambassador. And I'm a painter, you know. I'm I'm happy in the studio, right? Um, how do I, how do I do that? Uh, but you know, I've had a, a long interest in in uh, Chinese art, Chinese philosophy, Chinese thinking. You know, beyond the the surface level of you know calligraphy or or you know uh, ink painting. You know, what makes a Chinese painting? How do they think? How do, and what's the the philosophy? So for me, for my proposal. I spoke about that. I spoke about diving into that further, really understanding it. And I spoke about the connections, you know, the conversations around that, connecting with people, having conversations, having studio visits, creating a body of work, having a show, you know. Um, so yes, I might be in the studio, but I'm also connecting with people. And I'm, you know, and and I think um in, in my proposal, I you know, I mentioned people. In particular, you know, this person here who's doing this, I'm working with them, and this person here, um, and you know that I had real connections. And like Dr. Dandona said, there's a a balance between. You know, I'd been to China before, and uh, so I had some connections there. But I think the limit for China is you can have been there either three months or six months prior, and that's it. And I had I had been there, I think, uh, around two months or so. So I, you know, I, I fit under there. But I used, I didn't, you don't want to hide that. I, I, I actually let them know that my time there had helped me understand how much deeper I can go. Um, so, you know, the, but when you're applying, um, there's this real balance of what my project is, where I'm going to do it, and with whom. And you kind of have to juggle all three at the same time. Um, you know, for me, my project started from who am I? And what do I want to do? Um, now, when the coronavirus hit and it, originally China was off the table, it looked like Europe was a possibility. So I had to suddenly take this Chinese oriented Fulbright project and, and find out how could I go somewhere else with it. And, and so I had to dig deeper again to find out um, or how can I make this project relate to something in another country? Um, and, and that's hard. And, and you know, like Ellen said, you have to research the country. When I was looking at switching countries, I was somewhat more country agnostic, actually. I mean, the country mattered, but it's actually going to be the affiliate that mattered more than the country. Um, but you had to tie it into the country. You have, you know, you have to tie in. So, so you had, you know, I had to do my research and, and uh, you know, I was looking at the Netherlands and there's lots of great art there. And, Rembrandt and Van Gogh, and there's ways to tie it in. And music, you know, I was talking about sound art in relation to my painting. Um, I want to talk about the affiliate a little bit, um, because I think sometimes, you know, in Dr. Dandona's case, you know, your affiliate was very happy to work with you, and that's great. And it sounds like they knew about the Fulbright, or there's, you know, awareness. You know, in my case, it was, so what is a Fulbright? Right? What? Wait, you're doing what? So, 
your funding. I mean, they, they didn't, you know, the person I, or the people that I spoke to was a chain of people to find out, you know, the right person to talk to and, um, you know, you know, different possibilities and find out with whom I really resonated. Who could I work with for a, almost a year? And who can I depend on? I've, you know, I, I, I saw a message, one person saying, anybody know anybody in, you know, who was already in, this person was already in China. Anybody know anybody at this university who could be an affiliate? You know, I guess this person, uh, people can suddenly lose an affiliate. Take care of your affiliate. They're very important. They may or may not get much benefit from you being there. They might, right? I mean, you have to make sure there's a, you know, there's a give and take, but, you know, my, I don't think they're getting paid. You know, I don't think, I think it's more in the interest and the, and the, um, the exchange. So I think that's one thing I really want to say is take care of your affiliate and also make sure that you can depend on them, that this is somebody you want to work with for a little while. Um, when I went for China to find an affiliate, I went through, I had more contacts there, my own personal contacts and also people uh, who had been in China and had contacts. So I had kind of a web to build on. When I was looking to go to Europe, I tried the same thing and it really didn't work out. So I ended up just doing web search and, and you know, emailing people and, and uh, starting somewhat cold. Um, and that was harder and it was, it, it's a slow process. I, start early. If you're looking for an affiliate, start early. It takes a long time. Also, you're working internationally. I mean, there are time zones. I was, I was in graduate school, I was writing my thesis, or I, spoke, no, I was supposed to be writing my thesis, but instead I was up until six, I was up until six or seven a.m. talking to people in China. So you have to allow for that, that there, there's time zone differences, there's cultural differences. Um, how you talk to somebody, how you approach somebody, assumptions that we make, they're, they're not the same. Um, and that is what the project, that's what the Fulbright's about, right? But, but getting into it, we have to work with that. Um, I think, um, yeah, you know, the, the language part for me going to China, if I didn't, I know people who went there and didn't know Chinese and in China, they had a program to teach you some Chinese first. I don't know how they did that in China. I mean, to me, you're, you're very limited. But there are, when I was looking at some countries in Europe, I was like, you know, I, I speak Spanish and I can pick up French if I need, but I'm not going to get Dutch or Norwegian. I don't know. But you could get by with English. So um, it's not just language requirements, but what do you need to be successful in your project? I think that's very important as well. Uh, and the other thing that I thought about in terms of the country is where do I want to have connections? For the rest of my life, right? You know, it's not you're not. I mean, life is hopefully long, and you're you're not locked in, but but you are building strong connections, and that will grow. And you know, where do I want to build for my career, for my life, for who I'm, for who I am, what I do? Where do I want to build connections? Um, let's see. Just want to make sure if there's anything else. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I would just repeat again that the fact that this is a cultural exchange program and really emphasizing community engagement. But again, you know, I want to just maybe reiterate that it can be really different because I was a little worried at first. You know, when I thought about art and community engagement, I thought, well, I'm not Ellen. I don't know how I, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean that, right? I mean, Ellen's an expert in you know, community engagement in her work. And that's not been my. Uh, forte. You know, I've, I've been a painter in the studio, you know, leave me alone, I'm painting. Um, but there are ways to make that still in, about and include community engagement. And, um, and, and that, that it's essential that you include that, but that you make it real, right? You know, how do, how do I and can I engage with the community? Um, and also, and I think Dr. Dandona spoke to this as well, there, there has to be some depth. Right. You know, so if, if, if I had gone and said, yeah, I want to learn some Chinese calligraphy, that'd be cool. 
no way <laughs> that, that wouldn't fly it was that i was looking into deeper aspects of chinese art and how and and chinese philosophy and how it works with it and applying it to what i do and therefore making it a conversation using some old western some techniques some new technological techniques mm -hmm. and making it a conversation across time across culture and then one thing you mentioned um alan in your uh, presentation was uh to speak to the politics and the culture when you're applying mm -hmm. um as I understand, and, and I believe the application is read on both sides. It's read in both countries. And Dr. Dandona would, would know more, but you have to understand the context in which it will be read. Again, remember where I went, you know, or I work, no, where I'm going. I'm going to China. <laughs> it's, a different, it's a different situation than in the US. Yeah. If I talk about things that we think are just fine and dandy to talk about in the U.S., no way it'll go through, potentially, right? Yeah. So I, you have to be aware of, of where you're going and, and who your audience is and what you want to speak to. When I went to the, um, there's a big meeting in the summer, gosh, it was last year now, before we were all either went or were supposed to go to China, or actually it's for all of Asia. Um, my project was really different. There was one dancer and a whole lot of scientists and a, a natural scientist. And I think there, there were a few social scientists, but not a lot. Um, and, you know, people talk about their project, you know, this, this, I'm, I'm going to go paint. I'm going to hang out in the studio for a while. And, it, you know, it was so radically different. But again, I found a way that that is still about people and it's still about connecting. So take what you do and make it about connecting. I'm glad you mentioned that, Robert, because I, I know we've got some painters on this call. And so yeah. I think a lot of people have a curiosity about how do you take a, what can be a somewhat isolated practice and convey its importance and relevance to the Fulbright yeah. Committee as well as the country. And you did a really good job of explaining that. So. I think that's right. And, yeah, I can, if you want, I can just add a little more, just not to take too much time. Just, just a little, we want to leave some question time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'll, I'll, the way I did it was I talked about studio visits, critiques, consultations, mm -hmm. research from you know, written sources and original work. Um, so, it, you know, very much speaking to, I'm going to, I'm going to be working you know, with other people. We're going to go, I'm going to their studio. And come, it's what artists do often. Not always. Sometimes we lock the door, but uh, but being that socially engaged, you know, painter. But I'm going to be talking with other people. I'm going to be sharing and learning from them, and they're learning from me, and we're talking. Yeah. That's great. Wonderful. Well, now opening it up for um, questions. Feel free to, if you want to, turn on your mic and just verbally ask a question. Feel free. If you're more comfortable with the chat, feel free to use that. Both are um, both are available. Anyone? Well, I'm glad to see that was helpful for painters. Um, <laughs> feel free to feel if you have more questions about that. Feel free to ask more. Hi. Um, <laughs> how are you? Um, so I was wondering, like, when you were coming up and brainstorming your ideas, um, did you did you find it? Um, more of a thing that you did on your own, or did you kind of find someone that you could run those ideas by and to bounce that off of, um, to kind of help you find like a way to know if you sound crazy or not with your ideas. And you know, if, if it's something that sounded feasible to other people, because I know we're artists and we're always thinking things in our heads. And sometimes when we try to communicate those things or get them out, they might not always sound like the greatest thing, but I mean, were you able to find somebody and how, how did your process for doing that first, you know, going from you as an artist in your notebook, coming up with things to the next step of actually making your proposal? Uh, this, this for me, or is it? Um, for any- oh, for, Okay, I wasn't sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, just because you mentioned as an artist, that's why. 
Um, yeah, I am a painter. Oh, great. great. Um, hopefully you have somebody close to you that you can talk to, right? I mean, we all, hopefully, we, you know, and I did, but the number of people in that group was very, very small, very small. And I remember even being told, after I passed the first round, being told, we gained the great, the great advice of, oh, you'll never get it. And I did, right? Um, because people, but the reason is people often think that you won't, that it's, it's too pie in the sky, it's too much beyond us. Um, it's not, and, and as you can see, people get it, you know? Uh, so yes, do, if you can, do talk to people. But also understand that not all advice is helpful or, I mean, it's, it's just their opinion, you know? So, um, yeah. I, I think it's really helpful to have people that you trust who can give you a sense of whether um, the application itself is persuasive and cohesive, whether you're making an argument that seems compelling. But at the end of the day, you know, the project, it should be about your passion. It should be something that is original, that is unique to you, that yes, is, is suited for, you know, what you're applying for, for the country, for the context, et cetera. But it's really that, that kind of unique personal vision um, and so I wouldn't worry too much about finding somebody to say like, yeah, those are great ideas. As much as I think it's helpful to have somebody who can say, you know, I don't know about the ideas, but you've expressed them in a way that makes me really excited to hear more, or this totally sticks together. And I wanna reiterate um, what has been said a couple of times as well, which is you aren't necessarily writing this for an artist. They do try to get artists to be the reviewers in the initial step. Um, but you really want it to speak to um, any reasonable person and to kind of arouse the interest of somebody maybe who isn't a painter, who isn't in your world, right? Um, and so kind of the, the writing aspects of it is, is really important in a way. Um, and I would say that for myself, I, I talked to a colleague in my department who's a really good writer um, and she read it, um, my initial draft and gave me some feedback, but also it was about doing draft after draft after draft until it was just really tight. And I'm not, that doesn't, again, I, I did it in one week. It was all day, every day for a week, but it wasn't, you know, six months. Um, but but being able to go through those steps to kind of keep working at it until you're really happy with it, I think is important. And yes, having that outside help is important. And I'm just gonna add real quick um, to what Robert said about finding uh, an affiliate or a host or a sponsor, somebody to work with. Um, you know, the Fulbright is for self-starters. And so you really, you have to have faith in yourself and you have to push sometimes. So when I started trying to find somebody at the institution I wanted to be at, I literally got an email from the dean that said, why are you emailing me? I'm on the beach in Spain. Don't you know that people <laughs> take July as a vacation? So I started a month ahead of time, you know, which I should have started six months ahead of time, but you know, a month ahead of time, but yeah, everybody was on vacation. So start early, give yourself time to do enough drafts. You don't have to torture yourself, but you wanna have four or five or six go throughs. Um, and get somebody that you trust to read it, but somebody who's supportive. And that can be a friend or an academic peer, you know, but yeah. But you don't want somebody who's gonna shoot down your ideas. You just want somebody who's gonna tell you, yes, your passion comes through here. And I think also one thing I wanna add is, uh, first of all, really, they're really good points. And, and I agree, you have to start early to find the affiliate it can take me hard. I remember one of my drafts where I had written, you know, I want to do you know, Chinese, study Chinese art. And one of my friends said, yeah, it's a little vague, <laughs> you know? And, and of course I knew exactly. <laughs> not to be that vague, but you know, I just missed that when I wrote, like, oh yeah, that's, that's pretty vague. You know, it's a pretty big topic. Um, and so that does speak to knowing about where you're going and, and showing that you know showing that you're aware of, hey, I'm, I'm actually speaking about this time period in Chinese art for this reason. And, and because 
you know, it, they, they have these kind of specific, specificities in this time that relates to my art for these reasons, um, it, you know, or going to Scotland or what have you, you know, you have to, a specificity in what you're writing without being, with keeping it, you know, uh, readable to people who aren't experts in the field helps let them know that, hey, you know what you're talking about and, you know, you're serious and you're aware of where you're going and what the history is, and what you're doing. I mean, I had two. Some of that will come. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Some of that will come through the process of writing, though. I mean, it. I, I think everybody's first draft is probably really, you know, very general. But then you refine your ideas as you go through those steps. I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead, Ella. I'm recognizing folks on this call, and um, some are MCAD related. Uh, very good news. We have a really strong cast of Fulbright fellows at MCAD. Um, super awesome. Um, but uh, as Dr. Dandona emphasized, you do not have to be affiliated with an academic institution to apply. And I would encourage you to still pursue that because Fulbright gives us excellent free tools to search the Fulbright alumni catalog. Um, so you can search um, who are the Fulbright alumni in my region or in my topic or in my practice. So you can, even without academic affiliation, and we're really lucky at MCAT in that way, you can still find um, wonderful, generous fellows who are excited to, to check out and um, help. Um, so just know no matter what your circumstances are, you can still apply for this thing. Yeah, any other questions? That was a really good one, Shelby. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have one. Yeah, Chris. Um, are there um, examples of successful proposals out there that you can go and, and research as far as, you know, like writing style, things like that? Absolutely. And if you um, just type your email into the chat, I'm going to send a link to the presentation from today. And that has a link to a whole folder of examples. Um, and you'll find that they're all written in very different voices. Um, each person is very unique. Um, some of them are for painters, designers, installation artists, social practice artists, um, as well as lots of scholars um, as well. We've got uh, several several examples across a wide, wide spectrum so that you can really get a sense of um, options. Can I just add to that real quick, Ellen? Um, I, I think not only are there a variety of voices, but it's important that it's your voice. It's important that it's something that represents you, that helps you stand out a little bit so that they really see that this project is important to you personally and that you have a, a, a commitment to it and a stake in it. One of the number one things that they are looking for when they review applications, that we're looking for when we review applications, is um, that somebody's going to be able to accomplish this, right? And so part of that is about having the skills, having a good project, but part of it's also about passion, that, that this is where you want to be and it's what you want to be doing. And, you know, that is about you as an individual. And so I think you shouldn't imagine, I don't think anyway, I mean, this isn't official advice or anything, but I, I think you shouldn't imagine that you have to force yourself to be like everyone else. On the contrary, as long as you're hitting those kind of themes that Ellen talked about, about fit, for example, they want you to be an individual. And everybody I met, they were doing just totally out of the box stuff. You know, I was I was in a cohort that included people working with supercomputers to study black holes and included, you know, mathematicians and uh, everything you could possibly think of. But the one thing they all had together, you know, in common was that they had these projects that were completely unique and were really specific to them. They were looking at the world in a, in a different way. So I think that's important, too. Also, one thing Ellen, that I forgot to mention, and, and I found this out as I was thinking about having to switch countries. Mm -hmm. Every country is very different. You did mention this a little bit. Yeah. But for example, you were saying that, um, you know, of course, I was looking at, you know, independent research kind of projects, but for people who, for example, want to go get a degree, mm -hmm. in some countries, tuition is completely free. Mm -hmm. And in some countries, tuition is really expensive and there's no help from Fulbright, or sometimes there is help. Every country is different mm -hmm. for everything. And it it's complex because 
there's so many different countries and then within each country there's different institutions and um it's tiring it can be when you're trying to figure out what to do if you know if you come in when i was fairly lucky at first because okay i'm gonna do china but later when it was well i don't know what country i'm gonna do boy that was a search you know so definitely yeah um I'll, i will just add too that um if you are thinking about doing it for a graduate degree um our mfa program for example as you know is two years um countries like the uk often have one year master's programs but if it is a two-year program and you only have a one-year fulbright then you have to make the decision about how you'll finance that second year um, it would be a similar issue with a doctoral program for example and by the way um, in the uk they have practice-based um, studio phds um, so so just keep that in mind i absolutely agree and in fact it's part of why i didn't matriculate when i did my first fulbright in quebec city um, because i would have had to both live on the stipend that i was given and pay tuition and i couldn't afford to do both so um, luckily i had a choice but that is something to keep in mind it's, it's dramatically different depending on the country read the yeah, details. And even stipends are different <laughs> the, the the stipend amount differs from country to country and yeah every yeah so Pay attention, you know, when you're looking at depending on exchange rates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean when I went you know from China and then to like in Netherlands, like the money changed dramatically. And uh yeah, so everything yeah, everything changes for each country. It's generally it's like, enough though. It's it's generally enough. It's not yeah, often yeah. enough to pay tuition out of, but if you um are at an institution that is free or very inexpensive tuition, it's definitely enough to live on. And some countries also include additional amounts if you bring um a partner or you bring dependent children. Depends on the country as well, but that's also a possibility. So mm -hmm. I um, I wasn't able to be profligate and um, do everything I wanted to do when I was in the UK, but I was able to support um, a family of four on my stipend. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I think, folks, we've reached the end of our time, but if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to email me and I will help um, track down answers. And I'm going to also copy all of these emails out of the chat and make sure that all of you get a link to that presentation so you can revisit and click on all the embedded links there. So thank you all. Thank you so much for doing yeah, this, Ellen. You.